Lena, um, your, your article focuses on how to operationalize existing guidance on GBV programming. And, and indeed, the, the DFID-funded literature review we commissioned and, and the network paper based on that noted that very few of the documents reviewed even mention the 2005 IASC guidelines, let alone monitor against them. Or let's say there's no evidence in the studies that, that or the studies don't explicitly say that. Um, and I just wondered, why do you think this is the case? And, and what do you think can be, can be done about it? Yes, thank you. And, and thanks, everyone, again, as Clea said, for, for tuning in for this conversation. I think this is part of not having that be the case um, going forward. But you know, the guidelines came out almost 10 years ago. Um, they were something that I think the GBB community has relied on. I've used them countless times in countless meetings to say things like, we don't need evidence in order to act, and you know, we all have an imperative to act. That's been very useful. Um, but they have very much been a document on a shelf. And I think that we, as the GBB community, haven't done the best job of really explaining and working with other sectors, as Clay has said, to understand um, really simple actions that can be taken to make everyone's program safer for women and girls and to reduce risk for women and girls. And so GBB becomes this complicated or per perhaps scary thing where if I don't feel that I have the necessary training and skills, I'd rather not do anything than possibly do something harmful. And what we know is that not doing anything can actually also be potentially harmful. So I think um, the revision process that's going on now, Jean Ward's article in the Humanitarian Exchange outlines that process, um, outlines how it is meant to be a very participatory process focused on operationali operationalizing the guidance in a way that makes sense for each sector having even these two-page tearaway sheets for each sector to be able to use as guidance, um, putting in place an accountability framework to know if the document is being used or if it, in fact, you know, starts to gather dust on those shelves again. And also, I was really encouraged to see the articles on a WASH toolkit on shelter and on food in this issue, um, because that is what's needed. It's, it's not just the GBB community putting out a document that's, that's useful for other sectors, but it's also other sectors putting out their own guidance. And so I think we can see come up some of that um, now coming forward so that you know, in the future, there, there will be these guidelines referenced, and there will be the WASH toolkit referenced, um, et cetera. Great, thank you. Um, I wanted now to, I mean, we talked, we talked a little bit about intimate partner violence being the most prevalent form of GBV, even in conflict settings, and the need to understand that better and respond to it. But, but this isn't to say that the levels of gender-based violence committed by combatants in such contexts is, is not also still there and still high in many contexts. And so, but I understand that holding armed actors, armed non-state actors in particular in some cases, is an easier straightforward. And so I wanted to ask you, Aurelie, um, if you could explain Geneva Cole's approach, what, what deeds of commitments are, and give some examples of how you, you've used them with armed non-state actors to try to address GBV. 